Hi, colleagues. It's John Fischetti, along with Scott Emig, and welcome to episode 21 of We Will Get Through This, Transformative Leadership for Disruptive Times. And Scott, how's your week going? It's good. It's been a busy week, spending more time here in the office. Um, you know, things are starting to feel a little bit more back to normal. Yeah, I'm calling this period, and I know this is just weird, Normal X, because a lot of folks have been calling this whatever we get to new normal. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure what it's going to be. And so Normal X has this edgy thing. Have you heard about Festival X and all these conferences which put an X at the end? I think it means exchange. But what I'm calling X is because it has an edgy 21st century kind of thing. And I don't know. We don't know what this is. So I'm calling it Normal X. And X might be plus Y because it all keeps changing. But so I'm calling this Normal X. And we're exactly where we ought to be. And uh, algebra teachers like it because we put a variable in there. I think that's great. And it's exactly in keeping in touch with this podcast, too, because I think we're trying to keep in the room in all these conversations about the fact that, you know, we're not we're not trying to find normal. You know, we want some semblance of comfort. We want some semblance of consistency, but we're not looking to go back to, to what, what was the norm. Exactly right. I think that's where I'd like to probe your insights and genius around a particular topic today. And I know you as a father and as a colleague and you are wired, as well as your partner's wired, to really finding learning opportunities that match the gifts, talents, you know, the God-given abilities of every young child so they can be the best them. And schools often spend a lot of years just pulling that out of kids. Mm -hmm. And I think many of the ways in which we did this in old normal um, was actually with a deficit model of young people, not an asset model. I know that might sound too education ease, but mm -hmm. do we play to the strengths of young people? And later in the episode, we'll talk about the strengths of our staff. I think that's, I think that's a, a wonderful place for us to spend some time talking. Um, we, you know, part of what we've talked about in prior episodes is the fact that we have this um, almost a conformity mentality that has permeated everything we've done. Um, and it, you know, and it, it, this, you know, the massification of education has forced us in many ways to try and create systems that, that work for the masses. Um, but the problem with that is, you know, the individual passions of, of our students, our own children, um, tend to get lost in that. And I know, um, you know, I, I think I've had the, I think I've had the luxury having been in education my whole life of having that mindset with my own children. Um, and I think there are a lot of educators out there and a lot of principals who also share that, that notion that while we're, you know, these, this is a school for the masses, it's really not. It's a school for the individual child who shows up. Exactly right. We've, we've created this assembly line, and I know that metaphor is probably overused, uh, where we assume everybody, because they're six, is in year one. We assume, you know, when they're 14 somehow, we, we understand their journey because of, you know, the stage we've assigned them to rather than for every child, it's going to be a little bit different. And certainly there's developmental uh, aspects to things where we can kind of predict. But exactly what that says about people is misleading. And then when we put labels around their literacy, their numeracy, and we sort them based on that, we've actually possibly even taken away their opportunity. That's kids who were labeled at the upper end of whatever scale we're using as much as at the lower end. And mm -hmm. the curse of all might be to label right in the middle. Um, Kids aren't born with those labels on them. We put them on them. And then that tracks them through a system which probably is self-perpetuating based on their postcode uh, or some disability study that was done on them early on which labeled them something that they aren't or they weren't. It, it, that's it's exactly, it's exactly right on. And um, it's interesting to think about how, you know, this this reality that we find ourselves in right now, is it, is it exacerbating that or has it provided opportunities for educators, for, um, you know, for children to find their passions and educators to find ways to connect with individual children? And, and I think, you know, again, you know, coming back to this notion of, um, you know, playing to people's strengths, we've, we've seen people really rise to the occasion in this, in this dynamic where they've created environments for their many, many kids in their class. Um, where kids are excited about this new reality. And, and that's, a, that's an amazing gift. It is, and I think the, the real culminating thought to me is this notion of 
of people worried about young people, not the most vulnerable, for sure, mm -hmm. but for most of our young people, worried about them being behind. So we scratch NAPLAN in Australia, which is the, you know, the end of course tests in three, five, seven, and nine, and in the U.S., mo the tests have been parked in most states, and including the SAT, ACT, parked in many universities, where they're just going off a of year eleven marks, and things would be probably just fine. But this notion, oh, they're behind, and I, behind what? What are, what are they behind? Because we've actually, as we talked a few episodes ago, we're actually moving. When have we really practiced self-regulation in schools? Which is sort of an education East term about students taking charge of their own learning and managing their own way of moving forward an assignment rather than the teacher's way. We've been doing that flexibility, ambiguity, critical thinking, using technology, which was banned just a few weeks ago. Now it's like, please use that technology. Please use video. I mean, look at all we've done to have the learning centered at the child level. And uh, could we get back to that? What are, what are we actually behind, except some arbitrary list of standards that we actually don't necessarily adhere to or want to adhere to anyway, put together by people who are likely never teachers themselves and or an assessment system that we know is neither reliable or valid, even if those who make them say they are. So that's a whole bunch of deficits of the system, not of the young people. Completely. And, and so to suddenly say to children, you know, to whatever they are, whether they're in kindergarten or year 12, to say to them, look, you know what, for this year, we're, we're not gonna worry about that, that end of year exam. We're not gonna worry about that final project. What we're actually going to worry about is that your well-being is taken care of, that you're excited about, about your own learning, that you feel, you feel taken care of, um, it, that you're engaged. And it's really interesting how, you know, a byproduct of the fact that we can't have students sitting in front of us, you know, a byproduct of that is that we actually are connecting potentially more with, with children. Fascinating, isn't it? We could be closer together, further away, and even understand more about their home life and the connections of that than we would have if we'd not gone through this, which is an amazing insight. And I think our pr early childhood and primary teachers have been out there in front on this to really now better understand what it is that children are doing and the impact of that. Um, and also how tricky it is to help a six-year-old stay in front of Zoom all day. That's not a, necessarily an easy thing. That's classroom management. That wasn't in any model that um, I was taught. And, and, and our brilliant principals out there, the ones who you know, have their, their finger on the pulse of what's happening in their schools, they're the ones who are, you know, who are saying, wow, I, I didn't realize that he had that, that capacity or I, didn't, I haven't seen that, that ability when I walked down the hall and, and, and entered his classroom. Um, to now know that um, you know, these teachers are rising to the occasion in ways that, was, that were never expected. Um, you know, teachers, we have teachers all over the world right now who are pulling double duty. You know, they're, they're now being asked to teach the, the students who, who show up and are sitting in front of them. And, you know, here in Australia, that's the, that's the case. If, if half your class is showing up and the other half is still, still online, there are schools where you're expected to pull double duty. Right. And people are doing it with grace. It's an amazing time to think about the things we don't want to give up that we never thought we could do. And that's in part what we're talking about today, that that notion of treating children for what their potential is, what, not what their problems are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we choose our doctors if we get a choice, depending on the medical system that we have. Do we want to go into a doctor the first time to get our ailments or to get our stories? And and basically, you know, our hospitals, sickness places or wellness places, you know, our schools places kids go to be fixed or to be inspired. And we're going to have to make sure when we come back from this, that we don't take that clinical model of that, you know, we have parts on the assembly line that need adjustment, right? We have, we have amazing humans who, if we join them in their journey, will be even more amazing and help us make a better uh, human future. With that, I see so many kids who have been a little shy, a little introverted in school, shining in this environment because they get to do school their, their way. Some higher achieving kids in the status quo may be really anxious and disappointed because they know how to play school. Mm -hmm. So that adjustment is also for the kids who have been winning in the current scheme, the upper kids, the gifted kids, or whoever we're calling our top students, the ducks of the class, they seem to be called, they're, they're missing out. And we also have to help them realize They've gotten something more. 
they're not missing out. And some of that might just be resiliency. <laughs> when things mm. don't go the way you thought, boy, is that a great skill for our very anxious, overachieving students. It is. The, um, I, I, you know, being a parent of one, one of those children in particular, I, I definitely can um, definitely can relate to what happens when you change, when you change the status quo. You know, when you, when you say suddenly these things don't matter and these new things do matter. And when you, um, when you change the game in a way that these children have, you know, we have, we have kids who've grown up in this, in this world where they do, as you, you've talked about, they, they go to school to watch their teachers, they listen, and then they, they're really profoundly good at regurgitating what they're supposed to. Um, when you change the rules and you say, look, that doesn't really matter right now. Um, that just shakes, shakes the world under these people, under these students. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, um, you know, I know you, you were in touch with a lot of principals and directors in the area. What are you hearing from principals about um, how this is playing out for them in terms of moving back from this, this you know, online back to the face-to-face? -face? And is, are you hearing anything about how things are changing in the schools? I was just online with a couple of our favorite principals in this region across New South Wales, Australia this morning and reflecting um, on you know, where they are in the process of recommencing schooling. And what they have started to spend time is with their staff really getting down um, in writing what it is that teachers don't want to give back. And it's amazing. They're so surprised at how much even recalcitrant folks just a few weeks ago now are saying, no, we don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But they want to embed that now in a revision to a school plan, that the school plan as it was couched, was mostly about how are we gonna increase our test scores with a little bit of well-being and some professional learning, you know, and maybe we'll throw in an iPad or, or something that sounds like future focus, project-based learning. But it still looked like school, it still felt like school in most cases. Either we need a brand new design, which there were models out there that are pretty stunning, or we need a different attitude to what pedagogy is. And mm -hmm. pedagogy starts with what a teacher assigns a student, this many words and, you know, 12 point font and you can't do this, or is it about a learning outcome that could be uh, engaged very differently depending on where you come from in, as, a, as a learner. So there's multiple ways to accomplishment or moving up on Bloom's taxonomy to really try to get students to not just regurgitate at the low end, but really take and apply stuff. So every product can look a little different. That requires us not rushing a syllabus. So what, that's what I was really talking to the principals about is, could we free ourselves up from saying to the state, we have to accomplish A to X in a given year, as opposed to we're gonna get through these learning outcomes in dense and deep and dynamic ways, you know, cycling them through you know, the, the DNA of what scaffolding is really about. And we're gonna be really happy with that, which gives us the time to breathe, which allows us to also build well-being in as the top agenda. But they're all really agreeing that well-being is now the agenda for the 20s. Um, staff well-being and student well-being and of course parent well-being once school starts will improve dramatically anyway we'll take care of that one just by reopening school exactly right I think that's that's pretty amazing that there are a lot of teachers out there who are saying I don't want to lose sight of, of what what I've actually gained from the past couple months you know we always talk about in education how you you know we're basically flying the plane and trying to fix it at the same time and it's it's impossible um, and it's not that the past you know, few weeks or few months have given us the time to stop the plane, but it's, they have given us a whole new perspective to, to look at how we're flying and what we're flying and to say, this, this doesn't work. Um, there are a lot of things that do work. You know, good people, well-meaning, you know, in many cases, wonderful curriculum. But I think there are also a lot of people who are suddenly realizing that um, it, we needed this. We needed this, this shift in focus to realize that what we were doing um, wasn't meeting the needs of every child. So um, I think that's, that's a pretty powerful message that you're getting from the principals. Absolutely. Let's, let's shift this then to, if you're leading your team, this notion of asset and deficit as well. That's sort of our big theme for today. And for everybody who's on a school leadership team or executive uh, in their various educational settings, uh, sometimes the thought is, well, you know, we can predict in a meeting what John's going to say or what Scott's going to say, or we know their weaknesses, as opposed to thinking of the strengths. And I'm 
hoping coming back from this, that's another learning we can take is that each member of that team has incredible value and together we're better off. Because quite often in teams, we, we get so used to people's, a foible sounds too negative, but the things they don't do 100% that we forget what they do that is actually so necessary to the running of the place, the, the detail person versus the big picture thinker, the person that can handle the crisis versus the person that behind the scenes takes care of all the little details, the, you know, that fr people friendly person versus the person that gets the forms all in and the reports done to reallocate the responsibilities based on people's strengths. So the new deputy doesn't just get what we call in the US, the books and the buses and the bad boys. Um, you know, that's, why, why don't we distribute this to the strengths and play to the assets of our team? And maybe then other teachers coming forward to be in those roles won't be worried that somehow they're gonna get assigned the, the thing that is actually the thing they don't know what to do with and then tough it out like a, a hazing or initiation right. I think we ought to reallocate the, the workload to what people do really well and celebrate them, which is I think where most teams are now, really reimagining and reappreciating, but it's just as likely to get back to crisis mode and we're just winging it, or then we're blaming each other for things we don't do well. So I know on the teams that you play in, you can sort of see what I mean, where uh, what if we knew that X, they, they do that thing really well. Let's other people don't even enjoy doing that. Let's let them do that. And then we'll cover these other things, which we don't mind doing either. Mm -hmm. might be interesting to ch rewrite some position descriptions for assistant deputy principals and other members of the executives. I think that's great because I, I do think um, we tend to see, we tend to see our team through our lens. And so we know what our own strengths and weaknesses are. And we also know that we, we want people who complement those and Invariably, that means we are kind of looking for the same skill set in across the board. Yeah, and I, I think your your point's exactly, you know, exactly right on that. Um, we need to we need to not just do it from our own lens, but we need to look at the the breadth of skills, the the depths of skills that our team members bring. Try to play to those strengths, and it's and it's the same old thing. If you have if you have a team member who's not bringing the strengths that you need. A, find what they do bring, highlight those, celebrate those, work, work to give them more and more opportunities in that area, but build on the other. Don't just, don't just step back and, you know, and continually give the same people the same work over and over because those are the ones you feel you can trust. And you were mentioning this to me earlier, but we've also seen rising up in our staffs some really shining stars we might not have known were so shining. Those that weren't really flustered by a move to online learning those who are actually mentoring others about even how to put a, a background in Zoom or something funny like that. People who are really risen to the occasion and are within themselves confident enough that they feel they could do this. Uh, and to find roles to keep them in as leaders in your team, because you don't want to have them go back and be that quiet, shy person in a staff meeting who you know, is not engaging. Because I think what's emerged from this is it's sorted out pretty well. Those who are the go-to staff from those that are easily intimidated by something like a global pandemic mm -hmm. and not to blame anybody for their own burdens. But I think we have a new group of leaders who have emerged and we don't want to lose that. We want to tap that, promote them, support them, make sure they're okay, but even get them with you in the, in the succession planning uh, next up, because I think that's what's exciting. We know people on our own staffs in our own work that we're doing who have really come through and others who have found new ways to put boxes around things that no longer need boxes. Let's highlight those and reemphasize that. So I think that's our task from this session today, Scott, is to really do an analysis of the talent of your team. Mm -hmm. See if you can't do some reshuffling. You've got new talent waiting to happen and even put together a new way of thinking about your org chart, if that's how, how you're wired, to look at your staff um, in terms of well-being and make sure everybody's looked out for, but really tap into those things we've learned and figure out how you're going to do those, not just the rest of this year, but on to next year, maybe change your school plan as a result, make mm -hmm. it less about testing and more about learning. And then what do you think from the student perspective, the learner, the, the kid perspective we want to emphasize? Um, I, I would imagine it's very much like with our, with our staff. It's this recognition that there is a tremendous amount of underutilized capacity out there in our kids. There's this capacity that's screaming to get out in some cases, and we, you may have seen glimpses of it in this pandemic. 
you know, this, that simply changing the dynamics of what happens every day has allowed little glimpses to emerge. And so just like we would encourage principals to look at their team and say, where is that underutilized capacity on my team? I think they need to convey that message. It's, it's, it's like a lot of what we do. If you begin to convey that with your own team, then your team will begin to convey that with their students. And so helping your team realize that um, this one size fits all approach, you know, and it's had its time. And if we know that uh, we can flip our understanding of what our role is, it's not to find fault, mm -hmm. it's to promote learning. And that every young person has tremendous strengths and capacities beyond what we even know, if we give them core foundational things, but also join them in their learning journey wherever they are not be so fixated on covering curriculum and much more about finding ways to inspire and engage kids. Do that, magic happens. And I think because we've been freed up a bit from the traditional norms of what's expected to be in a lesson plan or a week's activities or a unit, we might actually learn something that it gets us to really bring kids along on their own journey, not that they're playing school or doing school, that they're actually engaged in their lives and schooling is a major component of it. Um, I worry about the kids who get switched on when they leave school who have maybe been switched on a little differently now and are excited. And we got about a two week window before they're back just disengaged again, because we're doing too much of the work for them. I agree. And let's just hope they don't show up at school when the message is we're behind. We, yes. that's, the last, that's the last message those students need to hear. Absolutely. So, so I think, um, your call for our listeners to look at their staff, to look at the people whom they work with, and think about you know, how, what are the strengths that have emerged and how do we play to those strengths? I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful next step. Good, well, Scott, it's been great talking with you today. It's always a pleasure and this was a really good conversation. We hope it resonates with our listeners out there and we look forward to exchanging ideas or having you bring this forward to your teams to help provoke them. Thanks, John, always good to see you. Yeah, great, this has been episode 21 of We Will Get Through This, and we really enjoy all of the interactions we've had from folks around the world, and we look forward to next time when we'll come up with a topic to help people through their stroll through their park, their walk and their dog, their trip to work, or just uh, they've exhausted all their Netflix and they just want to see Scott and John on the, on the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, goodbye, John. Take care. You too.